Hello. In the previous lecture, we discussed many properties of elements alpha that are algebraic or a field F. In particular, we showed that when we add alpha to field F and look at the ring generated by alpha and F, it is isomorphic to the quotient of the ring of polynomials by the kernel of the evaluation map. And then we said kernel of the evaluation map is generated by a monic polynomial that cannot be written as a product of a smaller degree polynomials with coefficients in F. We call that polynomial the minimal polynomial of alpha over F. And uh, as a result, this means that uh, a polynomial with coefficient in F has alpha as a zero, if and only if it's a multiple of this minimal polynomial. And in fact, this uh, condition that it cannot be written as a smaller degree polynomial, we show that it's a characteristic property of uh, it can characterize uh, minimal polynomials. So meaning a mnemonic polynomial that has alpha as a zero, and it cannot be written as a smaller degree polynomials, as a product of the smaller degree polynomials, then that guy is for sure uh, the minimal polynomial. Moreover, because of the first property, we said, because of this property, we said, when we want to understand the ring F bracket alpha, then we have to understand elements of the quotient ring F bracket X by a principal ideal generated by a polynomial of degree N. And then we used long division in order to show that every element of this quotient ring uh, can be uniquely written as a polynomial whose degree is at most n minus one plus uh, the ideal generated by H. Now, an immediate corollary of this is that uh, every element of F bracket alpha um, can be uniquely written uh, as some constant times alpha to the n minus one plus a constant times alpha plus a constant. So alternatively, we say that every element here can be uniquely, uh, is a unique linear combination is a unique F linear combination of one alpha uh, till alpha to power n minus one. So when we say F linear combination, we means we mean that the coefficients, the scalar multiplications should come from um, the field F. Here n is the degree of the minimal polynomial of alpha over f. Again, you've seen a question similar to this uh, earlier, examples like this earlier, but let's go to the proof of this uh, theorem. Um, by the first isomorphism theorem, uh, we have in fact a, a precise isomorphism uh, that's uh, given over here. So the precise isomorphism is that uh, whenever I give you a coset that's represented by a polynomial f, I just send it to what the value of f is at alpha. So, and the point is that uh, it's, I mean, this, this is the first isomorphism theorem that gives us this, but if you think about it, if I change this coset representative, the difference would be a multiple of the minimal polynomial. So when I evaluate it at alpha, it doesn't change because alpha is a zero of the minimal polynomial. So in any case, by the first isomorphism theorem that we do know that this is an isomorphism, that means I can focus on this quotient ring. Now, for the quotient rings, I understand how the elements look like. And the elements of that quotient ring, uh, they are uh, of the form a coset that's represented by a polynomial of a degree at most n minus one. So now I have to apply this uh, phi alpha bar, this isomorphism that we just showed. This means I have to evaluate this coset representative at alpha. When I evaluate it, this means I have to plug in 
and we deduce that every element of f bracket alpha can be represented as an f linear combination of 1 alpha the, the dot alpha to power n minus 1 in a unique way. As I have mentioned it earlier, we've seen examples like q bracket i, every element can be represented as a q linear combination of 1 and i, or q bracket root 2, every element can be represented, can be written as a q linear combination of 1 and root 2, and q joint with the third root of 2, every element this time can be represented, can be written as a q linear combination of 1, the third root of 2, and the third root of 2 squared. The difference between the last example and the first two examples is um, uh, the big difference is that the minimal polynomial in the first two examples um, are of degree 2, but in the last example is of degree 3. Okay, so this, this theorem and uh, the results that we proved earlier, all of them uh, are indications of the importance of understanding the minimal polynomial of alpha over f. So far we know that this minimal polynomial is a monic polynomial, it's non-constant, and it cannot be written as a product of a smaller degree polynomials in f bracket x. The last condition brings us, and in fact all of them together, bring us, uh, brings us to the definition of irreducible elements. And we, we go over the definition of irreducible elements, we generalize it um, and try to understand them in the setting of an arbitrary integral domain. This will be important for us um, because um, we want to understand irreducible elements not only in the ring of polynomials, but also uh, when we add zero of a polynomial to ring of integers. So as I've mentioned, it earlier, part of algebra had been developed in order to understand, in order to solve Fermat's last conjecture. And um, mathematicians uh, wanted to do arithmetic, wanted to uh, understand multiplication better after adding zeros of certain polynomials to the ring of integers. So uh, in particular, they wanted to understand uh, what are the prime numbers, what is the best description of prime numbers, one way of thinking about prime numbers is by saying that they are the atoms of multiplication, meaning um, we cannot decompose them further. This is one way of thinking about them. And this point of view brings us to the definition of irreducible elements. Later, we will take another route and define prime elements. And we will see that in general, these two definitions are not going to be the same but in certain cases they are. Okay, but for now, let's stick to irreducibility and what, what are irreducible elements in an integral domain. So suppose capital D is an integral domain. Then I give you an element, small a in this ring. This element is called irreducible if, first of all, it's not a unit or zero. You see, a unit or, uni uh, or zero, they are not interesting from multiplication point of view in a sense that um, uh, I, multiplying by a unit, I can always undo, or multiplying by zero kills everything. But uh, let's say in integers, when I multiply by one or negative one, the set of integers stays the same. When I multiply by zero, everything goes to zero. So I kind of understand what's going on with, by those guys. But when I multiply by two, all of a sudden, I get something in between, I get, uh, set of integers. There is a, this kind of information behind this multiplication that we want to capture. Now, uh, that's why when we want to do, understand irreducibility, we forget about units or zero, and then we go to the atom condition, meaning uh, if I manage to write down A as product of two elements, it should be only the trivial way, meaning then either B is unit or C is a unit. Notice that um, if B is a unit, then everything is a multiple of B. In particular, A is B times something. In fact, that thing is B inverse A. So 
if I want to get a genuine new decomposition, I have to demand that the factors should be not units. So if I cannot do it, then we call A to be irreducible. Okay, so for instance, this is precisely how we define uh, prime numbers up to the subtlety that in, uh, in the case of integers, uh, prime numbers are always assumed to be positive. Uh, but when, uh, when I'm working with an arbitrary integral domain, it's not quite clear, uh, we don't have a sign. So we, don't, we cannot pick uh, uh, which one of these things we wanna pick and how to define it and so on. So we only say that uh, it should be up to a unit. So in the case of integers, it will be plus minus uh, prime number. Uh, how about ring of polynomials with coefficients inside a field? What are the irreducible elements there? It is crucial that I focus on the on, uh, ring of polynomials with coefficients inside a field. As you will see in the proof, this is kind of crucial. But in this case, we can show that a polynomial is irreducible precisely when it is not constant and it cannot be written as a product of a smaller degree polynomials. Later, we will show uh, examples uh, where the polynomial is irreducible, but it is, let's say, constant. Um, and when the ring of coefficients is not a field. But for now, let's stick to the case where the ring of coefficients is a field. Uh, this is an if and only if statement. So I have to go from right to left and from left to right. Let's go from left to right. I give you a polynomial. It is, I tell you it's irreducible. I want to show that it is not constant and it cannot be written as a product of a smaller degree polynomials in, with coefficients inside that. So let's start with why it's not constant. Because it's irreducible by definition, it is not a unit and it's not zero. But units of the ring of polynomials is the same as the units of coefficients, ring of coefficients. But f is a field. So the ring of coefficients, uh, so the units of f is the same as all non-zero elements. So this means saying that px is not a unit or it's not zero is the same as saying that p is not constant. So this shows that irreducibility implies uh, that p is not constant when uh, the ring of coefficients is a field. Next, I want to show uh, that it cannot be written as a product of a smaller degree polynomials. So suppose that they've written it as a product. So let's say P is G times H. Then because it's irreducible, either G or H should be a unit. But the set of units are exactly the set of non-zero uh, non constant polynomials. So that means either G or um, either G or, uh, sorry for that. So that shows that either G or H uh, have degree zero. What that means um, that uh, because uh, degree of G plus degree of H is the degree of P, that means that either degree of G is degree of P or degree of H is degree of P. So this means that I cannot write down P as a product of smaller degree polynomials. Okay, so this shows that the left-hand side implies the right-hand side. Now I want to show that the right-hand side implies the left-hand side. What does that mean? I start with a non-constant polynomial P, and I assume that I cannot write it as a smaller degree polynomial, as a product of a smaller degree polynomials, and I want to show that it is irreducible. So the first thing that I have to show is that it is not a unit, and it's not zero. But that's for sure because it's not constant and units of the ring of polynomials uh, consist of uh, constant polynomials. Okay, so it's definitely not a unit and it's not zero. Now let's focus on the multiplication part. Uh, I write P as a product of two elements and I have to show that one of them uh, is a unit. But I do know that I cannot write down P as a product of a smaller degree polynomials. So this means either degree of G should be the same as degree of P or degree of H should be the same as degree of P. Again, comparing degrees, we deduce that either degree of G is zero or degree of H is zero. What that means, because again, the ring of coefficients is a field, that means that 
either G is a unit or H is a unit, and that's exactly what we wanted to show. So altogether, we understand that um, this condition, that non being non-constant and not being able to write them as a product of a smaller degree polynomials, is equivalent to saying that uh, it is an irreducible element. So you see, uh, this immediately tells me that the minimal polynomial of an algebraic element over F is irreducible. Uh, in the ring of polynomials with coefficients inside x. So that's, that gives us a more interest, that gives us more motivation, that motivates us more in order to understand um, uh, irreducible elements. Uh, more precisely, uh, we want to understand the ring structure of F bracket alpha. And we know that that guy is the quotient ring, is isomorphic to the quotient ring of F bracket X mod alpha, the ideal generated by this irreducible element. What we want to show is that whenever I start with a PID and whenever we mod out this PID by a principal ideal generated by an irreducible element, we will end up getting the field. This is an interesting result we need um, many auxiliary results in order to, to reach to a state that we can prove this. Okay, so um, the series, the next series of uh, lemmas that we are going to prove have this uh, theme in them that how much information uh, remains, so passing from an element A to the ideal generated by A, um, how much information uh, we still have? Uh, what, what are we losing? What information are we losing? So it is a fairly vague statement, question. So, but you will see in the next series of lemmas that uh, in each one of them, the question is how much information do we get if I know the ideal generated by A to a certain extent? So for instance, the next lemma tells me that the ideal generated by A is the same as the ideal generated by B precisely when one of them is a unit multiple of the other one, under the assumption that my ring is an integral domain. This assumption is crucial. So assuming that D is an integral domain, we want to show that, um, assuming that uh, it's an integral domain, we want to show that a principal ideal generated by A is the same as the principal ideal generated by B, precisely when uh, precisely when a, one of them is a unit multiple of the other one. Okay, so this is if and only if a statement. Let's go from left to right. Assume that the ideal generated by A is the same as the ideal generated by B. That means A is a multiple of B and B is a multiple of A. Okay, now I can substitute um, this B over here and I get that A is um, instead of writing B, I write AY times X, and I use associativity, and I get that A is A times Y times X. Now, because D is an integral domain, so this is the crucial assumption, D is integral domain, we can deduce that either um, A is zero or YX is one. Now, let's go with the first case. If A is zero, then because B is a multiple of A, B is also zero. So then we get that B is A times one, both of them are zero anyway. So in this case, we are done. Now, if YX is one, that means Y is a unit. So B is a unit multiple of A and we are done. Okay, so in these cases, we are done. Now go from right to left. Assuming that B is a unit multiple of A, I can multiply by the inverse of that unit. 
I deduce that A is also a unit multiple of B. But that means B is in the ideal generated by A and A is in the ideal generated by B. But that means every multiple of B is also inside that idea and every multiple of A inside the ideal generated by B. But this means these two ideals are the same and that's exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, so all together we get that the principal ideal generated by A is the same as the principal ideal generated by B precisely when they are uh, unit multiples of each other. You see, this means we don't have sign in an arbitrary integral domain, but instead of choosing positive or negative, I can work with uh, the ideal generated by those guys. So that way, uh, that's kind of going to the core of uh, irreducibility property. Okay, so let's go further and see uh, what else can we get? How, how much information can we get from knowing that the ideal generated by A is in fact the entire ring? So in this case, uh, we get a very good statement even for an arbitrary uh, unital commutative ring. So if A is an arbitrary unital commutative ring, then a principal ideal, which is generated by A, is the entire ring precisely when A is a unit. Okay, so that's what we want to show. Again, this is if and only if, which means I have to go from left to right and right to left. Let's start from left to right. Assuming that the ideal generated by A is the entire ring, that means in particular, the identity belongs to this ideal, which means one is a multiple of A. And that's exactly the definition of being a unit. So we deduce uh, that left implies right. Now let's go from right to left. Assume that A is a unit. I want to show that the ideal generated by A is the entire ring. This means I have to show every element of the ring is a multiple of A. For every A prime, can I write A prime as A times X for some X? Now, if I want to solve this for X, I get that X can be chosen to be A inverse A prime. Or I can directly write it down. And I say that for every A prime that you give me, I can write it as A prime A inverse times A, a multiple of A. So it belongs to the ideal generated by A. And because A prime was arbitrary, this implies that the ideal generated by A is the entire ring. So now we have a very, uh, very good understanding of units in terms of the principal ideals that they generate. The principal ideal generated by A is the entire ring if and only if A is a unit. Now, the next uh, corollary is actually interesting. It tells us a way of understanding whether or not, um, whether or not a unital commutative ring is a field. Okay, so let's see uh, how we can do that. So the next statement says that a unital commutative ring is a, is a field precisely when, let me see. So precisely when it has exactly two ideals, one of them zero and the other one, the entire ring. And Exactly two, meaning that we are also demanding that these two ideals should be uh, different from each other. I should not, I should not have the trivial ring. So if we, if A has exactly two ideals, and okay, this is the unit of commutative, um, then it is a field. Okay, so let's again, this is if and only if a statement. I have to go from right to left and left to right. Let's start from the left to right. Okay, so uh, this means. Um, under the assumption that uh, every, so under the assumption that, let me, let me remember which one. Uh, so under the assumption that it, we have exactly two ideals, I want to show that it's a field. So the first thing that we notice that because uh, these are two distinct ideals, it's a non-trivial ring. That's the first thing. Now, I want to discuss why every non-zero ideal every non-zero element uh, is a unit. 
So I pick a non-zero element A, then I consider the ideal generated by this guy. But I have only two ideals. One of them is zero, the other one is the entire ring. So when I give you a non-zero ideal, it should be the entire ring. So the ideal generated by A is the entire ring, but we just discussed that in that, that case, A is a unit. Okay, so this shows that every non-zero element is a unit. You're fine. Now let's go from right to left. So I tell you that uh, F is a field, A is a field. I want to say that the, it has exactly two ideals. So the first thing first, um, because it's a field, zero is not one, it's non trivial. So uh, we have at least two ideals. One of them is zero, the other one is the entire ring. Now let's pick a non zero ideal. Let's call it I. Then this non zero ideal has an element which is not zero, A. But by assumption, uh, my ring A is a field. And that means every non zero element is a unit. But when I give you a unit, you know the ideal generated by that element is the entire ring. Okay, so this means uh, this multiples of A should be also, should, should also be uh, a subset of this ideal. So these two together imply that my ideal is the entire ring A. Very good. Okay, so now we have an understanding um, uh, of a condition in terms of ideals for a ring to be a field. But uh, we are interested in irreducible elements. Now the question is, uh, should we care about fields uh, when we want to discuss irreducible elements? Notice in a field, every element is either a unit or zero. So it has no irreducible elements. So if I'm interested to study, if, you, if I want to study irreducible elements of a unital commutative ring, I can forget about fields for now. So suppose D is an integral domain, which is not a field. Now, an element inside this integral domain is irreducible precisely when, again, now again, we are trying to translate uh, a property of elements into a property of the ideal generated by that element. So A is irreducible precisely when the ideal generated by A is maximal among proper principal ideals. Proper principal ideals. Okay, but I'm using a new word here that's maximal. So what does maximal mean here? Whenever I give you a collection of sets, then maximal element of this collection of sets is an element inside this collection that nothing else inside this collection contains it. Okay, let's again think about it. So we call capital A a maximal element in sigma. If whenever A prime, another element of sigma, possibly another, contains it, then it should be A prime. There should not be anything else inside sigma that contains it. If this happens, we say that A is a maximal element of sigma. Now, let's think about this and go back to the statement of the proposition. When we say the ideal generated by A is maximal, among proper principal ideals of D. What does that mean? This means, first of all, the ideal generated by A should be still proper, should be inside my sigma, right? So it should be proper. So this means the ideal generated by A is proper. That's the first thing that we have. Second, it should be maximal among these guys, which means what? Which means if it is a subset of some principal ideal, then either this principal ideal is the same as the one that we started, or it's not proper. That's why we could include it inside uh, this principal ideal. So that means maximum. So 
the principal ideal generated by A is maximal among proper principal ideals, if this property holds for every principal ideal generated by B that contains the principal ideal generated by A, either the, the ideal generated by B is the entire ring or it's exactly the ideal generated by A. Okay, this is what we want to show. We want to show A is irreducible if and only if this property holds. This is our goal. Okay, again, this is an if and only if a statement. You have to show that left implies right and right implies left. Let's go from left to right. We are going to assume that A is irreducible and I want to show that uh, the ideal generated by A is proper and we have this maximality condition. Okay, let's start with why it is uh, the ideal generated by A is proper. Because A is irreducible, we know A is not unit, and we just showed that an element is a unit if and only if the ideal generated by that element is the entire ring. So knowing that A is not unit, we deduce that the ideal generated by A is proper. So far, so good. Now let's assume that the ideal generated by A is contained in the ideal generated by B. What does that mean? This means A is a multiple of B. It's B times something. But A is irreducible. This means whenever I write it as a, as a product of two elements inside D, either the first one is a unit or the second one is a unit. If B is unit, the ideal generated by B is the entire thing. If C is unit, then it means what? This means I am I'm writing A as a unit multiple of B. But we showed that in that case, the ideal generated by A is equal to the ideal generated by B. Okay, so that's exactly what we wanted to show. That's exactly this statement over here. So we are done. So this shows that the left side implies the right side. Now let's go from right to left. Okay, I want to show that A is irreducible. That means I have to show A is not zero, A is not a unit. And when I write it as a product of two elements, one of them is a unit. Let's just start with why A is not zero. Suppose to the contrary that A is indeed zero. So this is the contrary assumption. So if A is actually zero, assumption. If A is zero, that means, that means what? That means for every element B that you give me, the ideal generated by A, because it's zero, is contained inside the ideal generated by B. Assuming that this property holds, we deduce that either the ideal generated by B is zero, which means B is zero, or the ideal generated by B is the entire thing. So for every B that is not zero, we deduce that the ideal generated by B should be everything. But well, that means B should be a unit. Therefore, D is a field because every non-zero element is a unit. But we assume that this is not the case. We assume that D is an integral domain, which is not a field. This is a crucial assumption that we are using over here. We get the contradiction and that implies that A cannot be zero. Okay, so now A is not zero. Uh, why isn't it a unit? Because the ideal generated by A is proper. Because it's proper, A is not a unit. So A is not unit and it's not zero. So far so good. Now I focus on multiplication. So suppose A is written as a product of B and C. I want to show that one of them is a unit. I do know that that implies the ideal generated by A is a subset of the ideal generated by B because A is a multiple of B. Uh, but then by maximality of the ideal generated by A among principal uh, proper ideals, we deduce the ideal generated by B is either the ideal generated by A or the ideal generated by B is the entire ring. So if the ideal generated by B is the same as the ideal generated by A, then uh, we deduce that we deduce that uh, they are unit multiple of each other. So A is B times U for some unit U. 
Now I write it down and we deduce that uh, we, we, instead of A, I'm going to write down BC. So BC, maybe it's better if I switch the order of them. So this is, I write it like this. So this implies that BC is BU. Now I use cancellation law and deduce that C equals to U is a unit. So this means that if the first condition happens, then um, I can deduce that C is a unit. Now, if the second condition happens, that implies that B is a unit. In either case, we, we see that AB equal to C, A equals to BC implies that either B is a unit or C is a unit. So altogether, we get that A is a result. Okay, good. Uh, now we have an understanding of irreducible elements in terms of the ideal generated by uh, that element. So next, what we want to do, um, we want to describe ideals of quotient rings. So why are they important? Uh, notice that um, so far we know a ring, a unit of commutative ring is a field precisely when it has exactly two ideals. So if I understand the set of ideals of a ring, I have a possibility of distinguishing uh, a field from not a field. That means maybe that this approach can help me to understand whether or not a quotient ring is a field. So if I want to understand the right condition for a quotient ring to be a field, I need to understand what are the ideals of a quotient ring. And this brings us to this next lemma, which seems uh, pretty similar to uh, the correspondence theorem in group theory, where we understand uh, the subgroups possibility of subgroups or subgroup structures of uh, quotient groups. Okay, so suppose A is a unital commutative ring and I is an ideal of this ring. I want to understand ideals of A over I. What are they? Um, the claim is that ideals of A over I, all of them are of the form J over I for some ideal j of a which contains i otherwise j over i doesn't make sense you see j over i only makes sense when j contains i as a subset as a subgroup okay so the claim is that every ideal of a over i is of the form j over i where j is an ideal that contains i moreover two different j's with with the with this property cannot give us the same quotients. So that's this is statement. If I know that two ideals contain I and I happen to get the same quotients, then these two ideals are in fact single, single one. So all these things uh, are captured with saying that the map from the set of ideals of A that contain I as a subset to the set of all the ideals of the quotient ring, which send j to j over i, is a bijection. Okay, so knowing that this is a bijection is the same as saying all these uh, things that I have mentioned. Okay, so now uh, why why is that the case? Um, okay, so I need to show many things. Uh, one thing is why when I start with such a j, j over i is an ideal of a over i. So clearly it's a subgroup because uh, j over i is a subgroup that we know from group theory. Now uh, we focus on multiplication. I pick an element inside the quotient ring. Let's call it a plus i. And I pick an element inside uh, the set j over i. Let's call it x plus i. That means x belongs to, to the ideal j and A belongs to the ring, small a belongs to the ring capital A. Because J is an ideal, I can multiply by A and I will be still inside J. And that means the coset that's represented by AX belongs to the group J over I. But that is A plus I times X plus I, which means j over i is closed under multiplication by elements of a over i. Equivalently, j over i is an ideal, and that's exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, so this, this shows that 
uh, in this case, J over I is an ideal. Now I go the other way around. I start with an ideal of A over I, and I want to show that it hits up the form J over I for some J. But what is that J? It should be all the possible um, cosets. Um, so J we define to be uh, all the elements of the ring capital A, where the coset represented by a small a belongs to the ideal J bar. Okay, my claim is that this J, J is in fact an ideal. Um, it's rather easy. Uh, let's quickly check. So I pick two elements, then the cosets that are represented by these two elements belong to J bar. J bar is closed under subtraction. Therefore, uh, A1 minus A2 plus I is inside J bar. But then, by definition, that means the difference between A1 and A2 is also inside J. Now, why is it closer under, closed under scalar multiplication? I pick an element inside the ring C. I pick an element inside this ideal J. And by definition, that means the coset that's represented by A belongs to J bar. J bar is an ideal. So therefore, the coset represented by C times this coset still belongs to J bar, belongs to J bar. And that means that C A is inside J. So that shows that J is indeed an ideal. It is easy to see that I is a subset because when I pick an element inside I, the coset represented by this small a is the zero coset. And therefore, it belongs to J bar because J bar is an ideal. Therefore, it belongs, it, therefore the neutral uh, element, the additive neutral element belongs to J bar. So A is inside J by definition. Um, okay, now finally, I want to show that two different um, ideals, J1 and J2, uh, assuming that they, they give me the same quotient, uh, should be the same uh, ideals. So by symmetry, it's enough to show that one of them is a subset of the other one. Then uh, we can show the other way around, and we get the equality. So say I want to show j sub 1 is a subset of j sub 2. I pick an element inside j sub 1. I look at the coset that's represented by this element. I know because this quotient is the same as this one, a plus i should be inside this set, which means I should be able to write it as a prime something inside j sub 2 plus i. But two cosets are the same precisely when the difference between the coset representatives belong to the ideal. So this means this implies a is a prime plus something inside i. But remember, i is a subset of j sub 2. So this guy belongs to j sub 2. This guy belongs to j sub 2. And therefore, a belongs to j sub 2. So this implies that j sub 1 is a subset of j sub 2, and the other way around is similar. And uh, therefore, we get the desired um, corresponding result, meaning every ideal of a over i comes from an ideal of a that is sandwiched between i and a. Let's see how this can help us. How can this help us? Um, so as I've pointed out, our goal is to use this result in order to understand under what condition a quotient ring is a field. A quotient ring is a field precisely when it has exactly two ideals, the zero ideal and the entire thing. But I understand that there is a bijection between ideals of A over I and ideals of J that are sandwiched between I and A. If I have only two of them, this means such an ideal that's sandwiched between I and A should be either I or A. There should not be anything proper above I. Any prop there is there should not be any proper ideal above i. That brings us to the definition of maximality. You see, this means 
I should be a maximal ideal among proper ideals. So we define in a unital commutative ring, we say an ideal I is maximal if it is maximal among proper ideals. So again, what does that mean? This means an ideal I is maximal if first of all, it is proper. And second, if I tell you J is an ideal and it contains I, then it's either I or it is the entire ring A. So alternatively, I can write it like this, that the set of I ideals that contain I has exactly two elements and it is I or A. So this is an alternative way of saying I is a maximal ideal of the ring A. Okay, so now we are in a good place to um, formulate the precise condition under which a factor ring is a field. So suppose, uh, suppose I'm given a unital commutative ring A and an ideal I, the necessary and sufficient condition for um, the necessary and sufficient condition for this quotient ring to be a field is that this ideal is a maximal ideal. So the proof is actually fairly straightforward, but it is quite subtle because uh, we will be using results that we have proved earlier. We are not going to um, show that every non-zero element is a unit. So we are going to use the tools that you have developed. We know that the factor ring, any ring, in fact, any unital commutative ring is a field precisely when it has exactly two ideals, the zero ideal and the entire ring. But then we know the ideals that A over, of A over I are in one-to-one -one bijection with the set of ideals of A that are sandwiched between I and A. So knowing that we have exactly two ideals in A over I means that this set should consist of exactly two elements, I and A, and they should be distinct. So this means I is proper and there is no other proper ideal that contains it which means I is a maximal ideal. So that's exactly what we wanted to show. And everything is if and only if, so we get both sides immediately. Now, this statement is the strongest um, when, uh, so when we wanna work with elements, remember, uh, so okay, so let's go back to what we had proved about irreducible elements and uh, combine it with that result. So remember about irreducible elements. Did I have it over here? Yes. So in an integral domain, which is not a field, an element is irreducible precisely when the ideal generated by A is maximal among proper principal ideals. Now, if I am in a PID, then every ideal is principal which means being maximal among proper principal ideals is the same as saying that it is maximal. Okay, so now we go back to where we were and we see that, um, we see this statement that in a PID, which is not a field because we needed this assumption in order to uh, be able to characterize uh, irreducible elements in terms of the ideal generated by them. Um, when D is a PID and it's not a field, then an element is irreducible 
precisely when the ideal generated by that element is uh, maximal um, is a maximal ideal. Okay, so let's see why this is the case. So A is irreducible precisely when the ideal generated by A is maximal among proper principal ideals that we put for every integral domain. But here, every ideal is principal, and therefore the ideal generated by A is a maximal ideal. So that's a very nice thing. Now I can combine these two results. So here we know the quotients by maximal ideals. Here I understand maximal ideals uh, in terms of irreducibility. So we can combine them and get the next result, which tells me that in a PID, if I, if I tell you that uh, D is a PID and it's not an integral domain, then what? Then a quotient by a principal ideal so it's a PID, it's not a field. I give you an element. This quotient is a field precisely when this element is irreducible. This is a very nice statement that gives you a condition on a quotient wing to be a field and an element be irreducible. So this quotient is a field precisely when this ideal is maximal. So okay, let's uh, go through it. We have already proved that this is uh, the case, that the quotient of D by the ideal generated by A, by any ideal is a field precisely when the ideal is maximal. But in a PID, that's not a field. We proved that the ideal generated by A is maximal precisely when the element is irreducible. So altogether, we get this nice result. Now, uh, we immediately get this uh, beautiful uh, theorem, which says that if I give you um, a field extension and an element, which is algebraic over my field F, then when I add this alpha to F, I always get a field. This is a generalization of many results that we have seen earlier. Um, what is the proof? The proof is as follows. Uh, we have already proved that uh, the F bracket alpha is isomorphic to the quotient ring of the ring of polynomials by the ideal generated by uh, the minimal polynomial. But the minimal polynomial is irreducible. F bracket X is a PID, but the group of units are constant polynomials, non-zero constant polynomials, so it cannot be a field. It is not a field, and I'm modding out by this ideal generated by an irreducible element. So this corollary, this corollary implies, this is what we are using over here, that F bracket alpha is indeed a field. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. The proof here, as you can see, is quite, uh, uh, tricky, so we are using, we are developing a theory and then we are using different parts of this theory together. Every step is rather easy, but we put it together and we get this very nice statement. Uh, in particular, we do not give an algorithm to find inverse of a given element. That makes it a bit tricky. So for instance, if I give you an element uh, alpha, I tell you alpha is a zero of a given polynomial, and then this statement tells me that inverse of elements inside the ring uh, Q bracket alpha, uh, these inverses should, should be in the ring. And therefore, we should be able to write them as a Q linear combination of one alpha alpha squared. But can we actually do it? Can we find these coefficients? These kind of questions um, can be tricky. And uh, we will discuss later how we can actually handle them in the discussion and problem session. For now.